So Dr. Surgeon, carb, yes. carbohydrates, fats, protein are all macronutrients. The, yes. <clears throat> and minerals and vitamins are micronutrients. Yes. Okay. That's the general breakdown. Oops. And if you show you here. Let's get rid of this. We don't need this. Here's the thing about carbohydrates. About 60 to 65% of your diet should be made up of carbohydrates. And carbohydrates in and of themselves are not fattening. That right, fattening. Oh, shoot. Hang on. They are not in and of themselves fattening. And this is where a lot of people get confused. They hear they hear that carbohydrates make you fat. That just isn't true. We we need carbohydrates. They make up, uh, like I said, about 65% of your diet should be carbohydrates. And basically, they are these long branched chains of sugars. Basic component is a whole bunch of sugars all stuck together. So when we take them into our body, we break them apart from their chains, and then we break them apart into their individual components, which, and again, I'm simplifying a bit, but is basically glucose. And we know that is a sugar because it ends in oats. Now, going back to metabolism, I said there's uh, two things that we make more than anything else, energy and proteins. And energy is made with three basic ingredients, glucose, oxygen, and water. So if all day long we are making energy and proteins and we have to make every cell in our body has to make energy, has to make its own energy, and its main ingredient in making the energy, in fact, the default sugar for every cell in the body is glucose. That's the one that every cell in the body uses first before anything else. So that's got to tell you that we must require a lot of glucose. So when we take these carbohydrates into the body, we break them down into their individual components, basically their individual uh, sugar or glucose components. And we can put that glucose into the blood as much as need, that is needed at any given time. So the body is going to decide, uh, let's see, put a blood vessel this way. The body's gonna decide uh, to put some of these into the blood now, some of this glucose into the blood now to maintain that certain level that we wanna have all of the time. But then what do we do with the extra glucose? The extra glucose gets stored into what is called glycogen. This is a storage form of glucose. This is what I call the hall closet, just like the hall closet that is next to your front door you know the hall the that closet that's right next to the front door in a house is usually 
not the biggest closet in the house. It might be the smallest closet in the house. And it is there very conveniently. So when you need your winter coat, what you do is you just reach in the closet right before you walk out the door, grab your winter coat and you go. And when you come inside the house, first thing you do is you take off your winter coat, you hang it up in the hall closet. So the hall closet acts as a little storage site that's very, very fast. It's easy to put stuff into it. It's easy to get stuff out. That's what glycogen is. Glycogen is that hall closet because we can easily put the glucose into it. In other words, we can convert the glucose into glycogen very quickly, but we can also get it right back out again. It's easy to store. It's easy to get out. It's easy to store. It's easy to get out. And if we get it back out in the glucose and we can get the glucose back into the cells that need it, uh, then the cells can make energy. So you'll hear the word glycogen a lot uh, just because when we break down those carbohydrates, a certain amount is going to be used immediately as the glucose. And then there's going to be a bunch that's going to go into that quick storage form. So let me, let me get out of here for just a second and get back to here so you can see me. Okay. So if you look in my hall closet right by my front door, uh, there's enough room for about five winter coats. You can't put many more in there. Well, you could, but you'd have to smash them. But so we don't want to smash them. So we put about five winter coats into this hall closet, this right by the front door. And if I went to Macy's and I went shopping in the winter coat section, I bought five more winter coats. I brought them home. There's no more room in the closet in that little hall closet to fit them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take those coats and walk through the house and pull down the steps to the attic and walk up the steps to the attic and put them in a storage trunk way in the back of the attic so that I can still get to them if I need them. It's just not as easy. So when we take glucose in, some of it we use immediately. Some of it goes into this quick storage form called glycogen, or as I call it, the hall closet. Easy to store, easy to retrieve. So if my hall closet is filled up, and I go back to Macy's again, and I buy five more winter coats and I come back home, there's no room in that closet to fit these. So I got to walk through the house, pull down the steps to the attic, walk up the steps to the attic, put them in the trunk in the back of the attic. So I still put them in storage, but it's not convenient. It's not as easy to get to. Glycogen is easy glucose storage, quick and fast. You put it in, you take it out, just like the hall closet but there's, not, there's only so much room that you can utilize. There's only so much that'll go into that quick storage form. Anything left over has to go into long-term storage. So you can imagine what would happen if I go back to Macy's again and buy five more winter coats. Uh, buying five more winter coats, I come home, I have no place to put them in my hall closet. I gotta walk through the house, go up the steps of the attic, put them in the trunk in the back of the attic. Well, what's gonna happen? Before you know it, I'm going to end up with too much junk in my attic storage space. So, it's so funny. Uh, that is what we call fat. Fat is a longer term storage of those new, of the, of that potential energy in the glucose form. We can get that and convert it back into a glucose like we need to. The problem is it's not easy to do. The problem is that takes a lot of work, having to go through the house, pull down the steps of the attic, walk to the back of the attic, get that stuff out of the trunks. That's a lot more work than simply going right into the hall closet and getting it. So when you think of these things, glycogen is a short-term storage of glucose. Fat is a long-term storage of glucose. And look at how much more energy you have to use to get to that long-term storage. That's what we call a treadmill or an elliptical machine. That's why if you want to get rid of a extra fat, 
the extra glucose stored, you really got to put a whole lot of extra effort into getting to that point where you have to extract it from that storage. So the problem in my story is that we need winter coats. This is Philadelphia, but I went and bought too many of them. So the problem with carbohydrates is we need carbohydrates. About 65% of your diet should be made up of carbohydrates. The problem is people take in too many of them. When, when a person is sitting down eating a bag of chips and just mindlessly eating while they're watching a movie or something, they're not even thinking about it. And they're taking in more and more just because it's there. That's when it becomes a problem. That's why people say, well, carbohydrates make you fat. Well, no, they don't unless you're shoveling them into your mouth and you don't necessarily need them. That's when it becomes a problem. Uh, so extra, extra glucose, extra carbohydrates, put it that way. Extra carbohydrates are what gets stored as fat. That's when it becomes something that'll make you fat. Now, we know with proteins, because that, oops, that is the other, that's not what I wanted to do. Proteins are the other macromolecule here, the main macromolecule. Again, I'm not including water as a macromolecule of nutrition, although everybody else does, and that's fine. But to me, water is so unique and so different from everything else. I just put it in its own category. So we see that carbohydrates, I'm just going to abbreviate them as people do. Carbs. Surgeon? Yes. Uh, what category do you place water then? Yes, sir. In its own, all by itself. It is, it is true that it's a macromolecule of nutrition, but I put it in its own category of just water. Water is water. And the reason for that is because of the osmotic property that it has. Remember we talked about osmosis, the passive movement of water across a selectively permeable membrane from an area of low solute yes. concentration or high solute concentration. That is such a unique property that nothing else really is like that. So that's why I, I personally just put it into its own category. Although everywhere else you'll, most everywhere else, I think maybe I've seen it, other people have done something similar, but most everywhere else I've seen it, um, people include it as a macromolecule. Okay. Too many carbs, too many. I don't want to put that. We'll store extra as fat. Uh, so the next macromolecule are proteins. So first of all, the two main ways we use proteins are structural. Structural, make sure I'm spelling that correctly, okay. And like, um, like bricks. Used to build. So if you have to make something you want to build something, proteins act like bricks. You can put them together and build stuff. That's the structural part of proteins. Uh, something like hemoglobin. Remember, hemoglobin is that protein that is a seat on the bus. And that is where oxygen sits. That red blood cell bus has all these seats. And those seats are made up of hemoglobin. And of course, they have a little iron framework in there as well. Proteins can also act as enzymes. Now, we saw that enzymes can be used to build things up or break things together, or break things together, break things apart. Enzymes. Oh, 
catalyze a reaction. In other words, they will take uh, a reaction that was probably eventually going to happen anyway and ensure that it happens, ensure that it occurs. So examples of enzymes, let's see, what would be an example of an enzyme? Protease, uh, lactase, peptidase, And of course, you can recognize those as proteins because they end in A's. If it was a sugar, it would end in O's. The protein ends in A's. So when I say that these will catalyze the reaction, I think the example I used was uh, getting a charcoal grill an old school charcoal grill and filling it up with charcoal briquettes. If all you have is a match or matches, uh, could you actually create a fire? Yes, eventually you could because charcoal is flammable. Eventually a little piece of charcoal will catch on fire after you hit it with enough matches over and over and over again. And then slowly that fire will spread and eventually you'll have a whole fire in the grill, but that'll take a long time. So if you want to speed up the process, what do you add? You add charcoal lighter fluid. Because you add charcoal lighter fluid, then you only have to use one match. And now catch everything on fire. So that charcoal lighter fluid acts like an enzyme. It takes a reaction that was probably going to happen anyway and guarantees that it happens. I think this is this was one of the uh, videos in one of the labs. I don't remember which one, but I think it was a video in one of them. The only difference is enzymes can be used over and over and over again. Whereas the charcoal lighter fluid, once it's used up that one time, it's gone but enzymes can be used and reused and reused and reused. And eventually they'll need replaced. So where do we get proteins? Many of them come from our diet. We take in proteins that are shaped like this. and we break them apart into their individual amino acids. These are the things that I describe being like Lego blocks. Lego blocks are the building blocks that you can stick together and build things and then take them apart and stick them together and build things and take them apart and stick them together and build things and take them apart. So we do something similar to that with proteins. We eat foods that have proteins and then we break them apart into their individual amino acids. They're building blocks. And then we build them into shapes of proteins that we need. Now, in some cases, we do have in our body, with some of our proteins, we have a recycling center, which can take these some of these protein parts and just keep recycling them. Especially with the purines. We have two basic types of uh, proteins that we use, pyrimidines and purines. And the purines are the ones that go through this recycling center 
so that we can break them down, reuse them, break them down, reuse them, break them down, reuse them, build them up, build them up, build them up, break them down, reuse them, break them down, reuse them, build them up, break them down, reuse them. And then a lot of them we have to get from our diet. And those are, let me put in a new, new one. essential amino acids. Here's where people get confused about the language. They hear the word essential versus non-essential. And when they hear the word essential, they automatically think, well, those are the ones that we need and the non-essential amino acids are the ones that we don't need. That's what people would believe because of the language that's used here. But that's not true at all. That's not what this means because we need both. We need these and we need these. So then what's the difference? Essential amino acids we get from our foods. And non essential amino acids. These are not, yeah, not essential amino acids. These are the ones that we sort of make by breaking down proteins and building them up again. So don't think that we don't need non-essential just because it says non-essential. We absolutely need these. In fact, we can make things, let's see, what was the, what was the non-essential? Um, tyrosine. I think tyrosine falls under a non-essential now. Yeah. Because tyrosine, um, depending of, well, I'll, I'll show you why. Tyrosine is considered a non-essential amino acid. In other words, we make this. Phenylalanine is an essential amino acid. We get it from our foods. But here's where things can get interesting. Tyrosine our body makes, so it's considered non-essential. Phenylalanine is an amino acid that uh, we have to get from our foods. However, phenylalanine is converted to tyrosine with this enzyme, hydroxylase, right? Let's see, H Y hydroxylase, yeah. Phenylalanine hydroxylase. And you can tell that's an enzyme because so it ends in A's. So, if for some reason we don't get phenylalanine in our diet, 
then tyrosine becomes an amino acid that we also have to get from our diet. So even though we say, well, some of these amino acids we have to get from the diet, some of the ones are, are ones that we make. This is an example, this is like the perfect example of how in order to make the ones that are considered non-essential, oftentimes we have to use the parts that we get from our diet. So just a, a great overview, another a, a big picture overview of this is that we need both essential and non-essential amino acids. Don't get confused by the terminology because people will automatically just think, oh, if it's not essential, that means we don't need it. No, not true. FYI. Now, again, What's fat, the yes. Um, did you say um, the non-essential amino acid is the one we make? Non-essential is the one we make, yes. Okay. Essential is the one we have to get from our diet. So think of it that way. When you th think of essential amino acids, that it's essential that we get it from our diet. We have to get it from our diet. And then the non-essential ones, well, those are just the ones we make. Ooh, what happened there? Ooh, that wasn't right. Uh-oh. What happened there? Okay, so proteins, let me just finish this thought out. Proteins, if a patient takes in too many extra, will store as fat. Oh man, I forgot to mention, dang it. Hold on one second, I apologize. I forgot to do this. <laughs> I forgot I wanna get paid. I gotta make a note here. Please pay me for this, not you guys. I should have done this at 11 o'clock. Oh, my bad. Okay. Sorry about that. I forgot to do that. All right. Now, this is one of those things that really gets people disagreeing uh, when I make this statement, that if a patient takes in too many proteins, the extras will store as fat. Well... I know people don't want to believe that. Let me hold on. So I can grab my flipping cops. Grabbing one of my old biology, biochemistry review books. There's a picture in here somewhere. If you, um, if you're ever interested, the Lippincott Biochemistry Review goes into a lot of detail, but it also gives a lot of good information on nutrition. But it, it does go into the a lot of the biochemistry of it. Obviously, it's a biochemistry review book. There's I don't know in a minute. Okay, let's just go on to the lipids then, the fats. Again, please realize that I break down the um, 
I break down the macromolecules into three basic, basic types, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. I put water in its own separate uh, ca uh, category just because it's so unique. And I said that the macromolecules aren't necessarily macro, meaning they're just big. They're also in how much we use them, how, how um, available there are, how important they are, and micromolecules being just the opposite of that. So there are things that are small, like let's see, sodium, potassium. These are things that you've heard me talk about a lot and you'll continue to hear me talk about a lot. Those things, even though they're, they're small ions, you might think, well, they must be micromolecules. Well, you can, you can put them in a category of macromolecules because we use them so much. So macro in their usage and their, in, in their importance as compared to macro in their size. But I'm sticking with the three basic, well, three basic ones. Fats. Fats are important as a storage form of energy. Also, in construction, of cell membranes, just like proteins are. Also in creating hormones, especially I'll, 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 I'll put steroid hormones. I'll show you why. But they're important in creating hormones, but these two parts here in particular Cholesterol, which is a fat that plays a big part in making those cell membranes and in making those steroid hormones. Cholesterol plays a big part in those. We saw, we saw this in the chemistry part. We saw that some of these fats have these long chains of carbohydrate of, uh, of carbon molecules. And each one of those has four attachment sites. You see, most of these have two hydrogens attached, and then they have a connection to a carbon in front of them, and they have a connection to a carbon behind them. We'll call it in front and back. So this is what we'd call a saturated fat. It is completely saturated with hydrogens. The R just stands for the rest of the molecule there, the glycerol backbone, for instance. And then
this is what an unsaturated fat would look like. It does not have hydrogens completely attached to every carbon. Now, who cares, right? What's it? Don't, don't really care if one's saturated or not. Doesn't really make much of a difference. Well, the difference is that those saturated fats, if you look at those carbons, you're gonna have R, and there's gonna be a nice straight line. Okay, it's slanting down a little bit, but it's a nice straight slanting line. Whereas with the unsaturated fats, the molecule looks more like this. This is going to have two dips on it. It's gonna have two kinks on it. So if we were to stack these types of molecules together, the saturated ones would stack nice and neatly like stacks of wood. The unsaturated ones would have these different kinks that would not stack nice and neatly, which means saturated fats are solid at room temperature. Unsaturated fats are fluid. at room temperature. So which one would you rather have flowing through your blood at any given time? Probably the fluid ones. So this is why unsaturated fats are better than saturated fats. Now I did throw in a little curveball here. Because on this unsaturated fat, you can see right here, both of these hydrogens sit on the same side of that molecule. They're both on the underside of it in this case. We call that a cis configuration. Whereas this hydrogen and this hydrogen are on opposite sides of the molecule. We call that a trans configuration. Now, the problem with trans fats is they look like unsaturated fats, but they act like saturated fats. So the body doesn't really know what to do with them. So it doesn't do a great job of breaking them down. But uh, most simply, this is how, this is why saturated fats are not as good for you as unsaturated fats. Unsaturated fats are fluid and that's what we want. Fluid at room temperature, specifically, because you can say, well, butter's fluid. Well, it's fluid when you put it in a frying pan, but the inside of our, our bodies are not like frying pans. So we want to keep things as fluid as possible. Uh, and the way you can tell the difference is saturated fats are solid at room temperature. Unsaturated fats are fluid at room temperature. Butter is solid at room temperature. Olive oil is fluid at room temperature. So that's how you can tell the difference real fast. So what happens if a patient takes in extra fat it stores, not surprisingly, as fat. So you can see the trend there. If a person takes in too many carbohydrates, it stores as fat. If they take in too many proteins, it stores as fat. If they take in too many uh, fats, it stores as fats. All right, let's try to get my picture. Then when we have these biochemical processes that happen throughout our body, of which there are countless, uh, this is where 
those micromolecules of nutrition come in. This is where vitamins come into play. This is where minerals come into play. Things, things like um, vitamin C is imperative in the cellular reproduction and repair. Um, vitamin, let's see, vitamin B12. Oh, vitamin B12 is actually an interest, or yeah. So vitamin B12, just vitamin, let me think. Which is the one that you have to have intrinsic factor with. Yeah, vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is an interesting one because the body uh, does not absorb vitamin B12 really well all on its own. It has to have a component called intrinsic factor, which we make in our stomachs. And intrinsic factor binds to vitamin B12 and then we can absorb all of that really well. So if a person has had, I don't know, maybe stomach bypass surgery where part of their stomach has been removed, for instance, then their, their body is not gonna make enough of the intrinsic factor, which means they're not gonna be able to absorb vitamin B12. Uh, so we actually have to give them like 100 times the daily recommended allowance of vitamin B12 just for them to get to the point where they can actually you know, absorb it. And there can, then it can work as a coenzyme, again, in different pathways. Like, um, let's see. We talked about the Krebs cycle, I think, right? I think we did. The process of making succinyl CoA. Okay, let's see. And of course, water, well, water is, oh shoot. Sorry, water is used in the process of making energy way down there at the mitochondrial level, as are uh, many of those uh, vitamins and minerals as well in that electron transport chain. Uh, iron, of course, is used in red blood cells as a backbone to the hemoglobin molecule. Even copper, we even have copper in our bodies. I know people are familiar with the idea of having iron in our bodies, we even have copper which is used in the electron transport chain way down on the mitochondrial inner membrane there and making uh, ATP energy. So that is a pretty good overview. I know what I wanted to show you. This is the biochemistry book that I always sort of go back to. It's a It's a review book. So if you've had biochemistry in the past, then and it's helpful as a review. But even if you haven't had biochemistry, there is some really good information in here on uh, how we break down glucose in the process of like a, uh, glycolysis, building it back up gluconeogenesis. Let's see, this is a, a, a little more detailed 
breakdown of glycogen and such, or the glucose. Oh, I'm sorry. So, good source. Uh, I don't know if there is one at the school. It's a note in the library there, but you might be able to find some of it downloadable. So, something to look for. At least then you know it's a trusted site. And I'm going to grab uh, something to drink. I'll be right back. Excuse me for just a second. Be right back. Okay, thank you, everyone. Okay. So, are there any other specific areas in nutrition? I know Daniel was saying earlier about what it sounds like he was talking about was um, some of the the values, the food values, meaning like. Uh, in weights, in milligrams or in milliliters, something. And that sounds more like it was an issue with conversions, which of course is the math subject. Is there any way you can help us with, um, I know the formula is there, but I kind of struggle a little bit with that. How to find the, um, the body mass, the BMI? I, I don't know the formula off the top of my head. They yeah, don't put a formula there either. This is what, what one of the, um, the students was talking about yesterday. They gave you assignment to do, and then you have to go over the review. You take your time, go over the review, but sometimes they don't give you all the necessary information you need. Like, I don't see, I don't know maybe if I skip anything, but I don't see any example on how to find the body and uh, the BMI. The body mass or whatever the BMI. I don't see the um the 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 formula there. Like I have to Google Google and then try to figure out. But even at that, I kind of struggle a little bit. Yeah, I use the charts. Yeah, there's not even one in the in the in this textbook. Yeah. All right, we can see. Maybe we so that one, see. that one I'm afraid I, I can't help with. And like yeah. I said, I, I no longer have the actual um, nutrition book or my actual nutrition notes. Yeah, I don't even see it. They don't even have it. They don't even have the um, a, the chart in here. And I don't know why that is. Oh, here's a part about vitamins and minerals. Now it says here though that minerals are least important, but then it includes sodium and calcium. So I don't know why it says that because those are exactly what I would consider, or if 
I was going to consider any of those small ones, macromolecules, those I would definitely put in the category because of how important they are. Sodium, phosphorus, especially. Hmm. I, I think that a lot of the uh, students had the problems with just the, some of the basic definitions, especially like some of the stuff I just went over. I think that was one of the ones that would come up a lot. People just not having an understanding what those things were, uh, not understanding how proteins are made or what, or how amino acids play a part in proteins. What about the anatomy stuff that I mentioned? I did tell you that I put it. Yeah, I did. Cause I sent you an email. I posted anatomy um, lecture on YouTube and I sent an email with the link as well. So it's on there. So when it comes to the anatomy stuff, any particular questions? Come on, man. Dr. Sturgeon, are you going to send out like a study guide for anatomy? Yes. Okay. That's what I'll be doing uh, today and tomorrow. Great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. That's why I have all my old stuff here from. Very helpful because the test that I made. Yesterday, you just told us to read the old from where we started to the end. I was like, huh. I know it's kind of a, a lot of information, but if you give us the study guide, that one will help us a little bit. It will help, not even a little bit, but it will help greatly. Well, what I tend to do with study guides most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, I will tell you that if it's on the study guide, it's on the exam. And usually I include about 95% of the exam on the study guide. So sometimes I'll include things that weren't on the study guide, but things that you should probably know. Like if I said, what does the suffix itis mean? That's medical terminology from day one. You should definitely know what the suffix itis means. Inflammation? Uh, yes. <laughs> so uh, when I say I have a study, when I make a study guide, I usually include a few things on the test that aren't on the study guide, but it's stuff that I've said so many times. Like there's two things that we make more than anything else. What are those two things? Two things we make more than anything else. What are those two things? Protein. Wait, what was that? Come on, what are the two things we make more than anything else? Every second of the day since we were started out as a little cell, one single cell, we've been making two things. Protein. Protein and what else? What do we need to make proteins? What do we need to make anything? What do you need to get up in the morning? Energy. Energy. Okay. Energy and proteins. And if the word ends with an os, what does that mean? What is it? Sugar. Sugar. There you go. So you'll see stuff like that. There'll be a few things like that that I always include on the test. Stuff that I've just said over and over and tried to drill into your head. Uh, what is the cell that carries oxygen around the body? Things like that. Now that one I might wait until the final exam 
uh, because even though I've talked about red blood cells a lot, we haven't even talked about blood yet. So that'll be coming soon. Uh, other things like I, I started, wait, did I get to the lobes? No, I didn't get to the lobes of the cerebrum with you yet. I got it with the other class, but not with you guys yet. So not that so. Uh, let's see. Things that you'd see on the study guide would be name the muscle that starts on the sternum, also on the clavicle, ends on the mastoid process, referred to as the prayer muscle. Any idea? Do you remember that one? If I see an object question, I'll answer it. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean if you see them? You want me to take a knife and open up my skin, peel it back, and say this one right I, here? I mean, I, I have an idea. Isn't it the uh, sterno something mastoid? Sterno yeah. clido mastoid. mastoid. Sterno clido mastoid. Sterno clido mastoid. You right. didn't remember the clido meant clavicle, but that's okay because that's a weird one because it does it's it's not the same thing. Sterno clido mastoid. Sterno clido mastoid. Uh, or the what was the other? Oh, um, the muscle that causes you to stand up on your tippy toes, the calf muscle. What is that one? What's the first part of that one? You might not remember the whole name, but you should remember the first part. Gastro? Yes. Remember, that's the gastrocnemius muscle. I said that's the one that it's gastrocnemius means the stomach of the leg or the, or the leg stomach, which makes no sense. But that's actually what it is. That's that's the name of the calf muscle, the big main calf muscle, the gastrocnemius. And I said to you, don't get that mixed up. Don't get confused and say, well, that means stomach. So that's not the muscle. In this case, it is. That's how they get you. When it comes to muscles, I mean, it's really just memorization. It's not that difficult. It's just voluminous. And you might remember way back on, not even the day, not even day one, maybe an orientation. You may remember me saying that anatomy is not difficult. It's just voluminous. There's just so much of it that you have to learn. If we had a week and all we had to learn in the week was the name of the gastrocnemius muscle, that would be simple. Wouldn't be a problem. We could do that, but we don't. We have to learn all of them at once. The physiology is the tough part. You notice that muscle physiology that I went over. I said that in order for a muscle to contract, it needs to be told to contract. So the signal has to come down a nerve, down the neuron. That electrical signal called an action potential at lightning speed gets to the end of the neuron, has to be converted into a chemical signal, that's the acetylcholine, which crosses the neuromuscular junction, binds to the receptors on the muscle, which changes the permeability of the membrane, causes sodium to come rushing in, which then releases the stored calcium that is inside of the muscle cell to flood the compartment and causes those filaments to slide across one another. That we could spend a week on and you might not completely understand it by the end of the week. That's why physiology is so much more complicated, so much more difficult. The anatomy is easy. We can learn those muscles in a week, no problem. We just don't have that time. We're never afforded that time. So, another one that oh this is something shoot did we get to this part mm. did we talk about the brain stem on thursday briefly i'm trying to figure out i'm trying to remember exactly where we left off yeah there are three main parts to three parts to the brain stem. The brain stem is the part that connects the spinal cord to the brain. 
And the brainstem is made up of three parts. From the top down, it's the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. So that is something that we definitely are going to go over. And you'll hear again, and that will definitely be on uh, the test. The hormone that causes the wake sleep cycle. I don't think we got to that one because we didn't get to the, no, we didn't get to the diencephalon. We didn't get to the lobes of the brain. Oh, wait, okay. Uh, do we get to the layers of the brain? No, we didn't get to the layers of the brain either. The fluid that circulates around the brain and spinal cord. Did we yes, talk about that? that? Yes. What is that called? Do you remember? The cerebrospinal fluid, CSF. No, no, we didn't do that. We did not do that. Okay. No, do that, no. uh, okay, let's, let me back up a little bit then. How about the carpal bones? In the hand, how many carpal bones are there? Eight. Eight, correct. What is the name of the big heel bone? The, the bone that is a tarsal bone in our foot that it makes up the heel bone. Remember that one? Calcaneus, calcaneus. How many thoracic vertebrae are there? What? How many, thoracic, how many thoracic vertebrae are there? Uh, five fuse. How, how, many, how many thoracic vertebrae are there? 12. 12, 12 with a T, thoracic with a T. 12 with a T, thoracic with a T. How many cervical vertebrae are there? Seven. Seven. Say it correctly. Seven. Seven. <laughs> laugh, all, laugh all you want. Seven, seven. Laugh seven, all seven. you want, but you will remember that forever. Seven <laughs> cervicals. Seven, seven cervical. <laughs> yes. What is this big hole called in the occipital bone? Big, big hole. Uh, okay, but it's in the big hole. Yes, but it's in Latin, so. Hold on, just a I'm going to disappear for a second. It's in Latin, so. What's the what's the name? The actual name. Come on, man. Anytime there's a hole in a bone, we're going to call it a foramen. Okay. And this is a big hole. So this is the foramen magnum. Let's see. Um, what is the only true S-shaped bone in the body? Something is it the, the, I don't know, I don't remember. C A L something V. Yes, the clavicle. Yeah, the clavicle. <laughs> clavicle. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What is that stuff that we call earwax? Ear? No. Yeah, the earwax. What is that stuff called?
I'm going through my, I'm making notes in my uh, tests here. So that's why I've, I've got my thing off. So I, won't, I don't want you seeing the test. Um, and I don't want to record it for other people to see it. The stuff in the ear, that sticky stuff that we call earwax. Oh God. Cerumen. Cerumen. Oh. Cerumen with a C. Cerumen. All right. Okay. What is that? What's the name of the thin outermost layer of the skin? The epidermis. Epidermis. The epidermis. The epidermis. What is the name of the bone of the lower arm that is on the lateral side and follows the thumb? It's on the thumb side, the lateral side of the lower arm. Thumb side, is that radius? That's the radius. Don't forget that other video on YouTube has all of the bone stuff on it. So that would be a good thing to uh, review as well. How many ribs, how many ribs are there on one side of the body? 12. 12, good. Uh, there's a surgeon, a funny question. Uh, yes. Ribs and the uh, thoracic vertebrae, is this the same thing? Good question. Uh, because the thoracic vertebrae each have a pair of ribs coming off of them. That's where our ribs start. Our ribs start on our uh, vertebrae and our back, specifically the thoracic ones. So if there's 12 thoracic vertebrae, there's 12 pairs of ribs, meaning there'll be 24 total ribs, but there'll be 12 on the left side, 12 on the right side. And all we do is we just number them from the top down, right side, left side, one through 12. But yeah, they go hand in hand that way. Let's see. Um, What are those fat storing cells called in the hypodermis? The fat storing cells, what are they called? Sometimes they're called lipocytes, but we're going to call them adipocytes. Fat storing cells in the hypodermis. That's the subcutaneous tissue, the hypodermis. What are those lateral cheekbones called? The 
those lateral cheekbones, what are they called? <laughs> no one. It's on the Z. <laughs> I'll give you I'll give you that. These are the only bones in the body that start with a Z. Zygot. Zygomatic. 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 Here's one we definitely went over on Thursday. What's the name of the cells that make up the blood brain barrier? Ah. What is the name of the cells that make up the blood brain barrier? Um, it starts with an E. No. no. Remember the drawing I made with the blood brain barrier. I said the barrier, I think of a fence and the fence is made up of stars. And what letter kind of looks like that star? The A. The A. Astrocytes. Astrocytes. Another one that I know that we went over. Um, in the peripheral nervous system, the autonomic portion that prepares the body for fight or flight. What division is that? Autonomic peripheral nervous system. Which division prepares the body for fight or flight? Flight responses. This division. Google the answer. Asking, asking Alexa or Siri. No, no takers on this one. No. Sympathetic. Sympathetic division. So think of it this way. Let me let me come back here for a second. Think of it this way. If a friend of yours was being chased by a bear, and the bear sliced him with their claws a little bit, wouldn't you have sympathy for your friend? Say yes. Yes, you would. So yes. the sympathetic division prepares the body for emergencies. Fight or flight, you got to run away or put up your dukes. If somebody's house caught on fire and they were running out of their house, wouldn't you have some sympathy for them? Their house is burning down. Sympathetic pathway prepares the body for fight or flight for those emergencies. I got hold on. So I got to do this so you don't see the test. Okay. I'm going to do this one over there. Ah, here's an important one. 
and it's just a term just terminology just is nothing but terminology latin terminology the latin word that means straight erectus something rectus 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 means straight Uh, let's see. What about what about the dome-shaped muscle that separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity? And when it contracts, it flattens. Well, it becomes less dome-shaped, causes air to come rushing in the body. So this actually goes way back to I think week number two but also Thursday. Dome-shaped muscle separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. This is the muscle that causes you to breathe air coming in. A diaphragm? Bingo, diaphragm, good. I don't think we got to that yet, but we will. I don't think we got to that yet, but we will. What I want to do. Okay, in the lower leg, there is a long, very thin, laterally located bone. The lateral, thin, long bone on the lower leg, what's it called? It's behind the big one, uh, I think it's TV also. It's not the tibia, though. That's the larger one. Fibula. The fibula. What's the only bone in the body that does not articulate with another bone? Um, how do you say it? Hyoid. Hyoid. Hyoid bone. Hyoid. Hyoid. H-Y-O-I-D. Hyoid. How many sacral vertebrae are there? Five. 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 Okay. Five fused. fused together. Five fused together. Good.
What is the name of the flat bone of the pelvis, the large flat bone of the pelvis? The, um, not, it starts with an I. Okay. I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, it's Gilliam. Did I say it right? Ilium. Ilium. Now spell it. I L I U M. There you go. Good. I L I U M. Remember, I L E U M is the small intestines. I L I U M is the bone. Good. What's the largest? What's the largest bone in the body? And where is it located? The femur. Yep. Uh, I don't know where it's located. <laughs> The leg, the the foot, or after the it's between the leg. It's between the leg. <laughs> it's at the top of the, the <laughs> how you call it? <laughs> what would you call that portion of the leg? Uh, what would a person thigh? street? Maybe their thigh. The thigh, the thigh. yes, the thigh. <laughs> the thigh. Here's a good one, actually. Hard fibrous protein found in the skin, nail, and hair that adds strength. Is the um, it starts with M. keratin? M. Keratin. Okay, so, keratin. Keratin. What is the pigment in the skin? that gives us gives the skin its color melanin melanin yeah melanin good okay good uh wait where was i just a moment ago oh okay on the periodic table of the elements what does n a stand for sodium 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 good what about on the periodic table of the elements? What does K stand for? Potassium. Good, potassium. On the periodic table of the elements, what does Fe stand for? Iron. Iron. Good, all right. Wow, that was easy. Yeah, that one. Good. Awesome. Okay. How is calcium abbreviated? CA plus. CA, yes. CA plus, it has a two positive charge if it's an ion, plus plus. How many bones are in the adult human? We all agree on. 120. Wait, is it, is it 206? 206. 206. 206. 206. Yeah, 206. 206. What does the what does the suffix phobia mean? Fear. An irrational fear. Yes. The D-Y. Ask that again. I was saying, is a D-Y something? No. No, I'm oh. saying the, the, the um, phobia, uh, the suffix phobia means an irrational fear. My idea. But... What does the prefix dis stand for then? D-Y-S. Oh. Difficult. Difficult, painful, or mm -hmm. abnormal.
So you can use any one of them or they come in three, like? You can use any, you can use any one. Okay. So if, if a word like um, dysphagia, a condition of uh, difficulty eating or swallowing, it could be difficult or it could be a painful eating or swallowing or it could be abnormal. You can use, you can use any of them or you can use all three. Dysuria, a condition of difficult and or painful and or abnormal urination. Hmm. How about because I'm going to I'm going to make a, a review. Remember for this, so I don't want to give you everything right now, but you'll hear some of this again. Yeah, I think that's good for now. From that. Some of these we haven't talked about just yet. That's kind of a good one. Maybe I'll add that to it. The type of fat that has all of its carbon bonds occupied. You can't fit another um, hydrogen onto it. What type of fat is that? We just saw this. Any idea? We just saw it. That's a saturated fat. You can't fit any more hydrogens on a saturated fat. That kind of makes sense. If a paper towel is saturated, you're not going to be able to get, you know, wipe up any more water with it. It's already saturated with water, so it's not going to absorb any more. So a saturated fat has all the hydrogens that you could possibly fit onto it. All of its carbons are occupied with hydrogens. Let me go there with hydrogens. There we go. Okay. Uh -oh, did I write? That? Okay, I did. Any specific questions or problems? Again, I am going to make a review for this. Dr. Surgeon, what is the test again? For you, it's on Thursday. What about for the Wednesday class? It's on Wednesday? For the Wednesday class, it's on Wednesday. Okay. Yeah. Don't talk to them. Okay. <laughs> Someone yeah. asked me when was the test, so don't tell them. Don't cheat. Remember the importance of academic uh, honesty here. We want to maintain that. So don't share answers. If they try to share answers with uh, any of the B class, if, if A tries to share with B, say no, thank you. Um, yeah, that's what I have to say about that. Just don't do it. Any other specific questions about anatomy? Oh, I need more coffee. Hold on, wait, don't, don't, uh, hold that thought. I'm gonna grab another cup of coffee real fast, right back.
when it comes to the math and calculations, we'll do that on, I'm going to do it on Tuesday, right? Let's see it. After school, one o'clock. Yeah. And I'm probably going to start sort of from zero. We'll start from the beginning and work through basic math first. Then probably going into fractions, then going into, uh, man, it would be, that, that'll be good. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get us get us caught up to pretty much where hopefully everybody is now. I know that soon you guys are going to be doing dosage calculations. And if you don't have the basic stuff down yet, dosage calculations is really going to confuse you. Uh, it would be nice if we could sort of get a jump on it, but I don't want to do that just yet. I want to make sure that everybody has the basics down and go from there. I'm, I'm already expecting that um, we're going to do some, some of the dosage calculations in tutoring as well. So, yes. Um, um, did you say something about the bone behind the calf? You said, what is the name of the bone again? Behind the calf? That, that's the muscle. The muscle behind the calf muscle or the bone of the foot? Which one? The calf muscle. The calf muscle is the gastrocnemius muscle. Gastrocnemius. That's the one I said don't confuse because it looks like stomach because gastro means stomach and people automatically think, well, that can't, that can't be the muscle of the, of the calf because gastro means stomach. No, actually, in this case, it does. Okay. So don't confuse that one. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone? Anyone? Yes, I think I'm, I miss I miss a little bit because I had an emergency that I have to. Um, I just came out, so yeah. I wanted to know. Um, oh, hold on, hold on, one second, Daniel. Sorry. I just so you know, I am recording this, and I'm going to put it on YouTube also. Okay. So that we, you can still go back and if you miss something, but go ahead and ask. Yeah, I wanted to know about uh, uh, Thursday exams. Um, is it going to be before the lecture or after the lecture? It's going to have to be after because we didn't get through nearly enough of the nervous system stuff. And there's some really important parts of the nervous system that we still have to go over. Now, I will have those in the review, so you'll get a little bit of a, I'll call it a preview of it, but you'll get it that day as well. So it's not ideal. It's not the way I prefer to do things. Unfortunately, because we have a limited time, sometimes that's the way we have to do them. So is it so, going to be an exempl uh, exemplify or um, how? What do you mean? Is it going to be like on exemplify or is it going to be the, is the, the exams taking? I wanted to know. Is it, is it going to be like the quiz type or? It'll be like the quiz type. Okay. Yeah. You know, they're, they're starting to talk about making plans for um, schools to reopen soon with the vaccines and everything. So that could be a good thing. I mean, I'm really, really hoping that they make decisions on this quickly and we get back into the classroom every day. Uh, that will make a huge difference. I think it'll make a huge difference. I think you'll enjoy the lectures a lot more as well. Uh, but uh, then you'll get more out of them. But just as a side note, I don't know if that'll happen within the next six weeks or not, but boy, if it did, that would be great. We could actually be there. All right. Are there any other questions? Because if not, I am going to 
uh, be writing the test today, which is not really a big deal. I already have most of the uh, tests made up. I just have to sort of piece it together. And then I'm gonna make a review for it. And I will post that on YouTube as well. And I'll send the links for this, uh, for this one and for the review. Oh, I should do the review. Yeah, I'll do the review through Zoom also, although you won't be there. Can I do the review if nobody's there? Yeah, I don't see why not. Let me try that. And then I'll send that uh, to YouTube. I'll send you the links to those. I'll put them in the. I'll put them in. I'll put them in the um, uh, announcements for both classes. That would make sense. It's gonna be the same okay. test, same review. So I don't want to go through many more questions because I've already gone through a lot of them that you're going to see. Uh, so that only this will got a little bit of a mini review already. So that's good. But you also have an idea of what I'm going to be asking about. I'm going to be picking material from every chapter that we've gone through up through next week. So it'll still be like nervous system. I'm not going to go anything past the nervous system but we didn't get a chance to go into the brain much yet or even the brain stem much. So I want to get that material in and then I'm going to end it with nervous system. Yeah. And that should take us probably to, to the test. Is it going to be 50 questions? I haven't decided actually. I was considering that a little bit ago. Maybe 10 will be okay. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's going to be more than that, just so you know. <sighs> Simply because it's a lot of material, a lot of different chapters. And there's, well, there's a lot of stuff that we talked about. And we'll, yeah, so it shouldn't matter how many questions there are. Is probably, it going to be time? Is the exam uh, going to be time? Yeah, I, I don't know. Okay. Um, normally, what I have been doing in the past is I would give it at like one o'clock. So you would you basically have until, what, three o'clock to finish? Two hours? Hmm, that's good. Yes, of course. Gives you more room to think. It's going to be. Here, let me come back in. Wait, where am I? Okay. It's going to be so easy. You won't even be thinking. You'll, you'll finish the test. Go, that was simple. <laughs> you'll say, you know what? Give us some more. Give us some more. That's what you'll be saying. That's oh, good for us. Hard. Come That's on. good for us. But another question is like, um, is it going to be like you can skip if you don't maybe you don't know number one and maybe you know number three or number four? Is it going to be like you have to skip and answer then come back or you have to answer before you can put the other to another question? It'll probably it'll be one that you have to answer the question and not not skip and go back to it. Okay. Uh, the, re the reason I do that is because it sort of mirrors what you're going to see in like NCLEX exams exam, okay. where you have to kind of, you, you can't go back. Uh, okay. So to try, try to get you into that mindset. Okay. All right. Thank you so much and God well, bless if, you. If there are no other questions, but yeah, um, I will get that stuff hopefully completed. Can I, can I, can I ask one more question? Okay. Sure. Um, the question says, how many cells in the human body? How many cells in the, how many cells are in the body? How many cells? Yes. Where is this question? I just, I was ready last night and I see something like that. So I was just asking. Approximately this many. Approximately 10 to the 11. 
So it, does that mean like you have to sign oh. it by 10, by 11? Does, yeah, followed by 11 zeros, yeah. So 10 to the power 11 is like, Millions. It's a lot. Yeah. So depending upon your source, the number will vary a little bit, but it's going to be right around there. So ten to the right around ten to the eleven. That's not. That's kind of what most uh, will agree upon. Okay. Thank so you. Why? Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, where can I see the number of the cells in the body? And exactly what, what you just said, I just see they said 10 to the power 11. I was like, is this like a multiplication or I, I kind of confused because I don't know where to start with that kind of way. Just, and then just add 11 zeros. Okay. That's, that's a big number. All right. So somewhere in the trillion. Yeah. But you can imagine how difficult that is to know for sure. One cell, two cells, three cells, four cells. Get up to 5,976, 5,977, and then somebody calls your name. You're like, what? <laughs> oh, oh, now you got to start over again. So... All you can do is you can say, well, in this small piece of tissue, we can see that there's, you know, a hundred cells under a strong microscope. So if there's a hundred cells under this tiny little piece of tissue, in a tiny little piece of yeah, tissue, um, if you extrapolate from there, or, you know, uh, when they do DNA tests, they'll swab the inside of the mouth with like a big Q-tip. Mm -hmm. When they do that, there's about 10,000 cells just on the tip of that. Oh. So give you an idea how, of how small these things are. Oh. And then, of course, some cells are smaller than others. Sperm cells, there's about, you can fit about four to 500 sperm cells on the head of a pin. Wow. That's pretty small. So. All right. I would say that's a good guess of it. All right, well, I will stop this now and I will uh, go ahead and download it and then upload it onto YouTube. Good. And I'll just yes. call it, I'll just call it Saturday tutoring. So if you want to review it that way. Okay. And then, like I said, later I'll get the, I'll get a review done and I'll post that as well. But I have to complete the test first. I have to make sure I have all the questions done with the test so I know exactly what to review, so. Okay. Good? Yes, thank you. All right, well, I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Good enjoy the rest of your day. Stay thank safe. you for your time, Dr. Sergio. Thank you, no God problem. bless you. No problem, stay thank warm. Thank you for your time, bye-bye. Bye-bye, stay safe, stay warm. <laughs> Stay off the icy roads if they're going to get icy. Hopefully not. Yeah, hopefully not. And I will see you next week. Thursday? So, um, or you might see me sooner. One I'll see you on question. Tuesday. I'll see you on Tuesday. Because remember, <laughs> if, you want, if you want tutoring in math, I'll be there Tuesday. Weather permitting. Because I'm watching this storm come across and they're talking about lots of snow and lots of ice. So keep your eye on that. Um, I don't know if they, you know, if they close the building or not. If they close the building, hold on, actually. If they close the building, I'll send out an email and we could still have a tutoring online for that. I prefer not to because for math, I kind of like to see people's faces and I kind of like to have you work stuff out and not just wait for an answer. So I would rather not do it that way, but if we have to do it that way, we'll do it that way. But hopefully we'll, hopefully the weather won't be as bad. Everything will be good. And we'll, um, I'll be there on Tuesday for that. One more last question, please. Yes.
Yes. Um, he said you're gonna do the review. Are you gonna do the review before the, the test? Because you have two classes, Tuesdays and Thursdays, no, Wednesdays and Thursdays. Yeah. So are you gonna do the review before the test or? Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna do the review. Hopefully I'll have it done by today, tonight. Because like I said, I have to write the test to have to get that completed first. And then I'll do the review, then I'll post it. So probably worst case scenario would be posted tomorrow on YouTube. Okay. So it'll be it'll be the it'll be the same test, it'll be the same review. Um is that gonna be possible for us to take the test first before we start the class? Because you said um we're gonna take the um the class first. You gotta have the class first. Oh, because you want us to cover some of the topic that you're gonna drop because from. exactly. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I I it's not ideal. It's not the way I like to do it, but unfortunately, we just don't have a choice. Okay. Otherwise, I'm going to be testing on stuff that I haven't taught yet. Yeah, so that's true. That I don't want to do. All right. Thank you so much. Have a no problem. Weekend. If anyone else has a question, you can just stay on. If you don't have a question, I will see you on Tuesday, hopefully. Good. All right. Enjoy the rest of your day. Stay warm. Stay away from people. Filthy. All right, I'm going to stop recording.